On behalf of uh, CAP, I'd like to welcome you all to this fourth in our session. Uh, today's focusing on trades and climate. Uh, this is uh, CAP's virtual workroom series. And as I mentioned, this is the fourth one uh, that we're doing um, today. The first three, obviously, as I, as I summarized here, we heard from planners, we've heard from architects, we've heard from engineers, and this is the best for last trades today uh, and the, all that will culminate in uh, a panel that we're going to be doing for uh, during the National Trust Conference on September 29th from 4 to 5 30 uh, p.m. so save the date uh, in your in your calendars and in fact um, we will uh, be offering for those if you leave us your coordinates uh, we'll make sure to give you the zoom link uh, because if you're only planning on if you're not planning on attending the national conference we can uh, we can probably get the zoom link for you so if you leave us your contacts in the chat please make sure uh, we'll make sure to uh, to let you know uh, what the zoom connection is for that specific one only um through your cap moderator stephen collette who is both a building biologist and a building scientist uh, he's the owner of Your Healthy Home and also building manager for Faith in the Common Good. So, Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Theodore. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, best to last. It feels like it. Um, I think we've had some great conversations for those of you who have been participating in the last ones. Um, they've been really interesting, really different from each other and uh, really engaging. This one's going to be no different. We have uh, four great speakers today. I'm really delighted to have each of them here. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce them and then we'll, we'll get right into it. Uh, first, in no particular order, uh, Scott Harris, uh, Fundy Stonecraft. Uh, Scott's a heritage stonemason and a stone carver. Uh, he works both with uh, public and private buildings, as well as large masonry contractors to produce architectural stone carving, heritage design, and masonry conservation plans. Uh, his business, Fundy Stonecraft, is based in Sackville, New Brunswick. And I'm really uh, grateful to have Scott with us. Uh, next, uh, keeping on the East Coast is jo Josh Silver. Josh is uh, in Charlottetown at the Holland College, the Heritage Retrofit Carpentry Program, where he is the designer and lead learning manager. Uh, he's a Red Seal carpenter. Uh, married with uh, two kids, um, proud dad, um, and uh, he's actually a proud instructor too, because in his bio he's like, we've graduated 112 successful graduates from the program, and they work from the Bahamas to Boston Brownstones to Parks Canada, the Parliament Buildings, Province House Natural Historic Site, and private industry. So that's, a, that's someone who really loves what he does, because all he's talking about is his kids and his students, and I think that's great. Uh, Sarah Campbell is with us as well. Uh, she's a conservator specializing in the conservation of buildings and historic interiors. Uh, she's worked extensively across the UK, Canada, and Norway, and about to head back to Norway. She's a graduate of Willowbank, as many of you know Willowbank, and is currently pursuing her master's in conservation of cultural heritage at the University of Lincoln. Um, she's always had a deep interest in the craft traditions and how the characteristics of space can guide the way people occupy it, and we all feel strongly about that. There is endurance in places that are thoughtfully constructed. She views conservation work as an opportunity to promote the sustainable, minimal intervention approaches to today's living and building practices. And I couldn't agree more. Last and definitely not least, uh, Sam Trigilla. Sam is the president of Clifford Masonry Limited and Clifford Restoration. Uh, he's been married for 34 years uh, and has two daughters, one working in the heritage field as a senior project manager. That's definitely a proud dad there. Um, and uh, been a Mason for 40 plus years. He's obviously a CAP member um, and SWRI member as well. And he's the current president of Steeplejack and Restoration Masonry Association of Canada. Um, and he has a deep uh, passion for the apprenticeship program. And uh, we'll definitely be talking about that sort of stuff. So uh, with that, um, an incredible group of people here today. Um, I am grateful for all of them. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's have a conversation. What we wanna talk about is how the trades relate to the sustainability and the climate crisis that we have ahead of us. What aspects do we bring? What aspects do we have challenges with? What opportunities are there? Um, uh, what are we not doing great at? 
Um, these are the questions we want to talk about. So jumping right into the, uh, the first question, what's the best, what's the biggest opportunity for our industry for as trades in the heritage um, for improving sustainable practice? So um, I open it up. Uh, Sam, let's start with you. What's, what's, uh, what's the best opportunity for doing what we do for sustainability? Mm -hmm. I think Stephen, one of the one of the points I wanted to touch on for this question was to somehow get people to have a better understanding of these buildings and how they're constructed. Um, we seem to see a, a huge lack of knowledge uh, when it comes to that, and I don't think that the younger people coming either out of school or even in the trades. Uh, whether they're going on to the consulting side or the, the trade side of it, understand how these buildings were built. Sometimes you mention a word like a composite wall and they have no understanding of it because they just know a uh, rain screen principle, um, you know, brick veneers, uh, stone veneer, everything now is kind of lick and stick and, and you know, it's basically just that lipstick on a pig. Yep. Um, but they don't understand how these buildings are put together um, how they actually work and how they're acting and reacting. So I think somehow we've got to, and we do it as a, uh, myself, I go to all of the trade schools and I do some guest lecturing on whether it's lime mortars, uh, whether it's, you know, the, the composite wall, the different brick bonds of, of how to actually build and, and link the brick together to form that unison wall working in, and, and taking the loads. And even on the consulting side, we see it where uh, not so much with, with CAP members because they're always striving to learn and, and understand these buildings. And, and then that, the byproduct of that is the adaptive reuses. Uh, and, and by adaptive reuse, not just turning an old facade into a condo building or something, but I'm talking about actually repurposing the building for its original intent, whether it was a, a, an industrial building and, and keep it as an industrial building. So the, I think we have to somehow as a group uh, put more time and more focus into educating people so that they do understand these things. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and it's an interesting point, Sam, because when talking, when the engineers, when the architects, uh, in those conversations, they came up with the same thing. And, and Dima had mentioned that, you know, to, all their schooling is is all new buildings yet you know 80 90 percent of their work is all existing buildings um and they actually had troubles one of the people uh, on the call had troubles getting their their apprenticeship time their hours in because um it was all in old buildings they were working on existing buildings josh i'm curious obviously you're doing something different you're not teaching straight up carpentry um I'm just curious your thoughts about this opportunity that that Holland College offers and is there a demand? Yeah, thank you, Steve. And I, I'd have to agree with Sam. I think um, we could kind of compartmentalize much of what he's saying under education. You'll probably get a common theme from me this afternoon with me being an educator, but um, we, we need educated tradespeople for sure. I'd like to think we're giving our students a good education in heritage buildings, uh, but there's another there, there's other facets and and um, one we're finding is our architects have to be uh, trained in that our engineers um, our policy makers in the cities and um, the homeowner. So one, one um, challenge that our students have is they'll have a lot of education. Uh, a lot invested in this and go out and look at a job and put a bid in and um, they're definitely not going to be the cheapest. Um, if we could sit that homeowner down and talk to them, we can almost always land that bid because we're doing what Sam's talking about, that this isn't a stick frame. This isn't a simple job that some carpenters may be saying it is. So, yeah. so there's a huge opportunity for education. Um, that I, that I would really like to see. I'd also like to add that, you know, on a, on a positive note, the sky's the limit. This is kind of um, new to, to be talking about energy efficiency and sustainability with heritage buildings. We're kind of entering a new ground here. So we're doing a lot of applied research here where we're kind of paving our own way, which is pretty exciting and has a lot of opportunity for our graduates. That's pretty cool. 
That's pretty cool. That's great, Josh. So between Josh, Sam, and I, we have a bit more gray hair than, than our other two panelists here. And I'm curious about your experiences, certainly Sarah and Willowbank. Uh, not that we're, we're trying to you know, compare Willowbank and Holland College by any stretch, but with a more newer um, training, uh, how are you feeling in your own career with your own education about, about sustainability? Um, well, I think that two of you know the basic kind of guiding principles we go by in conservation are already really rooted in a sustainable practice. So, um, the principles of minimal intervention and repairing rather than replacing. So, I think um, maybe in whatever our approach is, in whatever project, it's just to constantly remind ourselves we can scale back our approaches um, to revive to kind of revolve around these basic pillars, and that goes a long way already in. Um, fighting climate change, I think. Um, and on a more general note, I don't know if this is kind of a silly example, but I was just thinking last night about kind of movements and trends that we're seeing in a lot of different facets of life. For instance, health and wellness, mindfulness, artisanal food, craft, this sort of thing. And whether it's up your alley or not, or it just makes you roll your eyes, I think it's, it's interesting to look at this because I think it's maybe a um, reflective of a desire of people to be more in tune with your surroundings and to kind of know a little bit more about where something comes from or how it's made and that really bodes well for us in the heritage field um, sustainability is really on trend i don't see why heritage can't be also um, and i think it's a really good opportunity for us to promote and make these links between sustainability craft heritage um, just to draw in a wider audience I think that's uh, hugely important, the beauty um, and the, uh, the visual experience, the tactile experience. Um, I don't know anyone who is excited about uh, conserving a four by eight piece of drywall painted white. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but a beautiful plastered wall, absolutely, right? Like that's, um, there's, tac there, there's a feel to it. There's an acoustic feel to it, all of that. Uh, yeah, and I think it's pretty easy to get people excited about that. You just have to pick your approach. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, certainly to Sam's point in the same way that uh, that peel and stick approach to masonry, uh, you know, that whole concept of uh, um, was wood and, and <clears throat> just faux everything. Um, I think inherently humans crave these tactile and, and, and physical experiences. Um, but we just, we don't understand until we actually experience it and actually touch real stone and, and real plastered walls. Um, yeah, Scott, you got thoughts on the opportunity with what you do? Um, yeah, I guess um, picking up on what all of them said, um, like if you're, if you're taking a, an approach from a craftsperson's perspective uh say you're you're burning your own lime mortar that that's going to make it you know theoretically carbon neutral right there um if you're coring stone that's going to greatly reduce your carbon footprint um just any any approach that you're taking from a craftsperson perspective is inherently going to reduce the the carbon footprint because um these buildings i mean our, our skills are based on pre-industrial um construction, before we hit the industrial revolution, we weren't putting a bunch of carbon into the atmosphere. So it's, it's just kind of inherent. And, and talk to me about that, uh, Scott, about, um, about your job site, like how it looks just like Sam's job site. <laughs> just smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, my job site, I mean, I can't even tell you what my, like, I'm usually wearing Crocs and, uh, <laughs> um, pretty high stress, high stress that you, but, the, but, yeah. the, but your use of materials and, and Sam, you had mentioned before and, and with Scott here, um, I'm just curious to the two of you about the choice of materials and reuse of materials. Scott, you start and then I'll get Sam to, to talk about what he does. Yeah, my uh, my job site. So the buildings I work on, um, I, I generally have either a, a really good sense or a rough idea of where all the material came from. I have a pretty good idea of, uh, if not where the lime was sourced, what's what's generally in the lime and what you know the general makeup of it is. So um, 
with the stone, like, yeah, what's on my job site is uh, generally a, a rough replica of, of lime mortar, um, a local sand, and the probably exact, uh, like, quarry stone source. Um, yeah. And, and my dog, and that's... <laughs> <laughs> and the dog where everyone needs a job site dog. now yeah. sam you had mentioned about um the idea of uh architects and we can slam them there's a few on but uh <laughs> we won't poke too hard but sam the idea of material selection and your experiences with what might be chosen so i, I steven wearing the two hats the clifford restoration hat and the clifford masonry hat I, we just took delivery of 14 containers of brick from Denmark for a project here in Toronto. And it, I, I don't even know what to say. First of all, you know, those brick were $3 a piece where a local brick is $1.10. Uh, so there's the cost. But what, what exactly did we put into the atmosphere getting that brick here to Canada and why? I have no idea. It was the selection by the designer and the architect and a specific look they were looking for. We have the same materials available and the, and the capabilities to manufacture them here, that brick. But we opted to go, and it, and it almost feels at times like it's a one-upsmanship um, on the consulting side where... Not so much the, the, the architects and, and engineers that are CAP members. I'm talking about the base consulting team. You know, you're, you're, you're dealing with people and you're getting, you know, we did a project in Calgary that had a, an architect from, from, uh, from England, Foster is a partner. And, and you're looking at it and thinking, wow, that is, to me, it's a little bit insane. I know we're going for a look, uh, that's great. Um, but, it never ceases to amaze me. Whereas on the restoration projects, it's very simple. In 100, 150, 200 years ago, people did not have the capability to bring over containers of brick from Denmark or Sweden. Or right. I'm telling you, we're getting brick from all over the world right now. We're getting stones from all over the world. I don't, I can't fathom that because we're always looking to local uh, entities. We just finished a beautiful condo project, very, very new design. The stone was from Prescott, Ontario. It's a beautiful stone, the the platinum. It, it, it's a lovely stone. Uh, we dissuade the owner from going to the route that he wanted was a stone from Africa because we did not feel as a company we could push something that took that much effort to get to Canada. I, I don't know why we don't push more local materials. The restoration project is simple. In the old days, it was very difficult to transport materials, so you tried to use local quarries. Toronto's full of buildings, you know, the Credit Valley material, or sources like the Berea sandstone out of Ohio, simply because it was easy to transport on the Great Lakes. Right. So, you know, we, we always look within a circumference that we know was, you know, fairly simple to get the materials here rather than, well, you know, now they're not quarrying that, so we have to get a stone from England that matches a red sandstone or something. So it really never ceases to amaze me that, that end of it. Well, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting point. And when we see these larger and larger um, engineering and design companies and, and firms, and they may be multinational, um, that, you know, everyone's used to using what they normally use at home. And sometimes we expect that, but we have literally the world at our fingertips, you know, and Scott, your point is, you know, you're doing smaller jobs and you're, you're doing a lot of that. And so you're using more local stuff. And these are really interesting challenges, uh, um, you know, that as our industry we're facing is the need for these communication between the different levels, whether the building owner, the homeowner, the, the design team, the engineering, um, it's a real serious issue and it's impacting the sustainability of the final project for sure. I, I'd just like to add to that, Stephen, if I yeah. could, you know, we're, we're, you know, we have a, couple of stonemasons and carpenters talking here and inevitably we're going to interface so we're we're rebuilding windows for province house right now well they're set right into wall of sandstone right so we don't i don't think we spend enough time in in our silos in our trades of 
uh, cohabitating and and mm -hmm. seeing what what does my how does my work affect you how does your work affect me yeah. um we're trying to do that very uh we're, we're pushing very hard here with at the college working with our stonemasons uh and it's being well received but i'm finding it does take effort uh once it's done it, it's going great but there's there's a bit of that as well yeah, now that silo between the different trades as well is an issue. And Sarah, with your varying uh, work that you do, uh, um, you know, what obstacles are you coming across? Is the name heritage even even an obstacle? Um, typically, no. I find I'm pretty fortunate in that when I get on a project, I'm there because it's a heritage project. Um, so in that sense, I I don't. I think. Maybe the biggest obstacle I find just in general is this public perception that we're this really niche profession and, you know, we're off in a corner tinkering away and we don't really have anything to do with the modern world. Um, and the reality is that there's really a lot of natural overlap between heritage and sustainability. So, and I think Sam touched on this earlier, but I think an, another obstacle is really misunderstandings people have about the way old buildings function in relation to their environment. So. You know, you work in buildings where, like, just on a, I don't feel like I should be wearing a sweater in the middle of summer because of the air conditioning or a t shirt in the middle of winter. And just these kind of ridiculous um, ideas that we need to place human comfort above the health of the building. Um, it's just awfully wasteful. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I guess another thought I do think I, it, it really depends on the kind of project you end up on, but I do feel like there's still really silo divisions between all the profession, the profession. So, you know, the office or white collar um, professions and the trades and the, even the occupants of the building, there's just not a lot of lateral movement designed in the way projects are run sometimes. So I do feel like I often show up, I do my work, but I'm not part of the bigger conversation of why something is being done. And that's, a, that can be a bit frustrating, but as I said, it, it's, it's really, it totally depends. Sometimes you're on a massive project and you just, you, you show up and you, you work, but other times you're the, you're the sub and that's your job. And, yeah. <laughs> and, but, it, but it is a big, because, you know, just like Sam had mentioned too, like the idea is like, well, Sam's got some ideas here about instead of Denmark brick, you know, and you've got some ideas and just that, that idea of, of that hierarchy uh, um, with the people who actually understand the materials and understand the building and understand the process and understand what's behind that wall or how to yeah, keep that and I, back. I think a lot that it's just it's really a pity especially when you're looking at heritage buildings because they have a lot of idiosyncrasies that you don't have in a new build and to be you talked if, if you if you if there are more conversations between sure the architect that's looking at the blueprints the tradesperson that's done the repairs on the building for the last 15 years but even the custodian who's fixed all the leaky pipes on the west side or or the the, the occupant who, you know, knows when the heat's on and like all these little things that can come together to paint a much clearer picture of the building that you're working with. And yeah. I've never been, I've, I've never had the privilege of working on a job where it's really that transparent. So yeah, that would be cool to be on a project like that. <laughs> Something we think about. Josh, I have a question about the idea of using the term heritage. Um, like we all use it, we're all members of the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals, but, you know, and you're, and you're graduating students with heritage skills, are we not graduating students with existing building skills? Do we, and uh, I start with Josh, but I put it to all of you, we're all working on existing buildings. They could be stunning parliament, uh, you know, uh, parliament house ones or, or provincial house ones. Or they could be, you know, a beautiful two-story brownstone down the street as well. Um, I'm just curious whether we, how that heritage versus existing building, is that an obstacle for us to gain more traction as trades? Uh, I, you know, I put that question directly into my curriculum, and and I try hard to answer that. It 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 is a difficult question. Um, I think you might have been poking around and I and we certainly see it here is there often is some stigma. If I have a heritage building, that means you're just going to add extra zeros to the end of my <laughs> my bid. 
Um, I'm going to have my hands tied with when I want to make some decisions, things like that. So, so we work hard to, to break those down. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's definitely that issue. Um, I think on a holistic approach, our, our community or our country really benefits from these. And, and you said it yourself, Steve, and I, the, the, the example I say is, you know, we're in beautiful Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island and some weekends there's four or five cruise ships tied up and tourists are here and they are not here to see the five-story vinyl sided apartment building uh, <laughs> that's not why they're coming and so there, there is that inherent need like a, as a culture we, we uh, should protect those and should keep that and luckily we're we're all like-minded. We, we could certainly do better to work together, but I'll just point out, you know, we talked about earlier um, that Sarah's from Willow Bank and I'm at Holland College. When I developed the program, I went to the four, the three big players, Willow Bank, Nova Scotia Community College and Algonquin. Yep. And I am very, I have a very strong working relationship with all three learning institutions with Heritage Carpentry. Yep. We kind of joke and say, we're not competitors, we're co-conspirators. <laughs> and I think what I'm getting at is there's this inherent passion and an inherent um, willingness to work together because we all kind of see the light that, that this is very important. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And Scott, with your, um, with your work, you know, oftentimes smaller scale, but not always, how is, how is that relationship uh, discussing heritage versus existing versus can't you just use some cement mortar and be done with it? Or, you know, like how do you experience um, these kind of conversations uh, with your clients? Um, with clients, um, yeah, it, it varies some. I, I think like the whole move to like, you know, harder mortars, for instance, um, is something that's part of like a larger, larger like cultural or societal um, uh, story. Um, so you'll find some people who will, would like refuse like a, a softer stone because they think it's going to deteriorate faster. Um, but a lot of people are really receptive. Um, something I wanted to pick up on is uh, in in some of the engineering discussion, I think it happened in architecture as well. Um, you know, everybody was expressing that, like, you know, our studies weren't in heritage, we have to learn it on site. Um, some people even talked about, you know, using intuition, which I think is a, a really scary word for, say, engineers to use. Um, I think, like, you know, the conversations with with people throughout the hierarchy and I, I've definitely been in that position that Sarah brought up of like you know chipping out like perfectly sound lime mortar that all the engineers are like oh that's really soft and like there's absolutely nothing wrong with it you spend your entire day like destroying a wall and it's awful um I think as a as a craftsperson I think you develop a huge amount of of um intuition like there's a lot of knowledge that like you don't even get to like actually like formulate it in your head. You, like you just know it. Um, Tactile knowledge, right? Just yeah, feeling yeah. that mix, right? Just feeling and, that mix. Yeah, and some of us do have the capacity, you know, some brain capacity, not all of us, but like um, I think just like for, for engineers and architects to like to figure out like, you know, how do we talk to like, how do we talk to these people? How do we uh, empower them to like kind of share their, um, their understanding of the material so that they can better kind of, uh, you know, develop an intuition or develop an understanding of these things that they never actually studied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's interesting that point, the, it, the idea that we just, we think about um, zero maintenance, right? Everybody wants zero maintenance. That's what the home despot sells, right? Um, zero maintenance, that's disposable. And, and when we think about the need for repairs, the need for maintenance, you know, on these, these beautiful buildings, uh, even existing buildings. Um, I did a job that had a two-story um, 1850s uh, school, brick school, yellow brick. Uh, and um, this drip edge halfway down, you know, um, had completely failed and the water got inside. And that was because it required maintenance. The drip edge worked and did its job keeping the water off the, the windows below and the wall, 
but the mortar failed and, uh, and but it was the disposable factor and and everyone's looking at it going well why is it doing that it's supposed to do that <laughs> you know like this is this is what we need to this is where the only part you need to repair and it protects everything else and so this idea of you know zero maintenance versus repair you know uh, ongoing care is really important as a professional because it's sustainable it's not disposable now moving along i just what do we what do we need what do we need to be to uh, to better fight climate the climate change and climate crisis what what do we need within each of our wheelhouses to to do a better job maybe to to get that message out better i'm open to any of you wanting to jump in there you know i i think um i have an example um and it, and it really um Owns the point that I think most of us are trying to get at. We, we're, we're putting in windows at Province House, where Canada was founded. So very high profile, very important. And of course, those windows have the original um, brass spring weather strip that goes inside between the window and the jam. Uh, um, and then also the interlocking brass piece at the bottom, the uh, uh, bronze, excuse me. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We had a great discussion, and, and I mean, I genuinely mean that because we actually had a discussion. So um, all parties that were relevant were there, including the architects, the people paying the bills, uh, et cetera. And, we, and I think we came to a great um, solution where the windows have to look appropriate when they're closed. But the problem is after people like us put in um, that beautiful work, that uh, what I would say, what a lot of tradespeople would think is magic. Like, how did you do that turn of the century type work? We're gone. And then that maintenance person is charged with looking after those windows. So in goes the um, AC unit in the summer and out, out go the flags and the drapery during parades and so forth. And we slowly destroy that, that bronze flashing. Well, then the window doesn't work right. And the maintenance people certainly aren't trained and probably if they're if they're worth their salt would they oh no no i don't want to touch that yeah so instead of being uh as minimally interruptive of the fabric as possible we came to the conclusion why don't we put modern foam gaskets where uh bronze spring gaskets used to be when the windows closed tourists come to look at it it looks 100 percent appropriate when they're open, they're very functional and user friendly and repair friendly. Yeah. And to me, that was a really good um, compromise where I would want that bronze there. Um, maintenance people wouldn't. And I thought, yeah, that, that's a really good solution to that. And I, and I think, I guess the bigger picture is to have those open discussions amongst the people that are, are going to have a hand in that. I well, really I think important. that's really important, Josh, that that idea that especially the, on the commercial buildings, the maintenance team, the, the, the building care team, 99% of the time just left out of the conversation completely. Right. Um, and even homeowners, right? Like how many times, how many homeowners actually understand, you know, their wood windows? Well, there's energy money, let's yank them out and put vinyl in, right? Uh, we've, we've all had that gut wrenching you know, uh, situation and when the wood windows can perform much better and, and the stone, you know, can perform and the plaster and, and the care and the finishes inside will last another hundred years. Um, yeah. Stephen, to, to Josh's point, um, over the last 40 odd years, I've been collecting different bits and we find it actually helpful and I just actually grabbed it. I don't know if you can see it well on the camera, but this was a, an old salesman sample of exactly what Josh is talking about. So all of the weather strippings are inside. The, <laughs> the uh, spring loaded, right? And, and you get a visual of the operation. So these were gimmicks that were used years ago to sell product, but now we're actually using that to educate people. And, <laughs> and you, know, you, cannot, you, can, you can try to explain it to them eight ways to Sunday. They yeah. just don't get it. What we see is a big movement of throw the old windows out and let's get new ones because they're weather tight, they're this, they're that. We have 
being able to get you great results with your old windows. Um, and, you know, rather than, rather than throw, everyone is in the mood of just replace it, replica, replica. When I go to these various schools, I spend the first five minutes explaining terminology. What is the restoration? What is repair? What is replacement? So that these young people start to understand the differences of these various techniques. Um, and you know, one of the one of the things that we always struggle with is that we find two kinds of people in the user groups, whether it's consultants, architects, engineers, uh, owners. Uh, there are two kinds of people. There, there are ones that will listen to us, you know, and, and I'm glad to hear that uh, Scott is using the terms and, and, and Sarah that they're referring to us not as just tradespeople, but as craftspeople and artisans, because these older buildings, it's not that lick and stick. It's not, you know, a simple running bond, which is the cheapest masonry you're going to lay as a running bond brick. But, you know, you 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 have all of these buildings where these people put their their heart and soul into to uh making it a, a very very beautiful surface you know when you, it's like you say you don't want to pull into pei and look at a, a five-story vinyl building like you know and the term that the vinyl people will tell you is vinyl is final yep. whereas we what we preach is you're, you're willing to steven the the end user is willing to spend a million dollars restoring their building but they will not spend ten or fifteen thousand dollars every year after that to maintain it. And what we're telling them is, you want to do this million dollar restoration every twenty years? Go ahead. Or you can spend for the next twenty years two or three hundred thousand dollars to maintain it. And what are we doing in essence? We're we're saving that building and the environment from that huge restoration every twenty years by just simply doing some maintenance. It's like you said, there are things in our industry that are sacrificial like a drip edge, you know, things like that. So why wouldn't we just maintain them? Yeah, and and that's an education piece that we simply don't have uh, in high school. We don't have a uh, learning. We don't have just general understanding of how buildings work. We don't we don't get that basic. You know, we also don't know how to do our taxes. So you know, these are some basic skills that we really helpful. But if we had that sense of understanding of how our homes work, how our buildings work we better understand the idea of trying to take care of them in a, in a manner uh, as we're talking about. Sarah, did you have a thought? No, yeah, I just, I couldn't agree more with all of those statements. I mean, I think that's, that's both the challenge and what we need in our field of work, because if you've got clients who don't understand their buildings, then um, it's, you're, you're already, it's, you, you know, you're not starting off on the right foot. And I think too that, um, there's there's a cycle both ways. Like either if you don't understand the building, the point of building maintenance, there's really no point in doing interior repairs, for instance, if the roof is leaking. So, um, mm -hmm. and then if you don't do that and the roof continues to leak, then the building is compromised and then it becomes more neglected. And then you've got this vicious cycle of neglect. And then you really do lose heritage elements that could have been saved. And I think so often it's, it's we, we can show up on jobs and because it has been allowed to be neglected for so long. So in some ways, it would be nice to be hired less because people understand buildings and they took care, better care of them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely, I, I agree 100%. Like I, I look forward to being uh, not a heritage professional. Less in demand. <laughs> um, and I just had two other thoughts, just general thoughts. Um, more specifically to what I do, what I do, because I work in conservation, I mean, but it probably applies to a lot of the other trades. Um, it would be really nice to have more research into greener alternatives to solvents. And we still have a huge dependence on um, petrochemical products and local sources for conservation supplies and materials because we're often shipping in from the US or from Europe. Yeah. Um, and then also just greener building sites in general. I mean, the amount of building sites I've been on where there's not even recycling facilities. Like I'm constantly just stuffing cardboard into my backpack to carry home so I can recycle it. <laughs> And, you know, these are huge building sites. You just think about the amount of waste. It's, it's appalling, really. Yeah, yeah. And unless, and again, from the same perspective from our side on the heritage versus the new green, you know, certificate, unless you're chasing that, you know, do, you know, um, points and whatnot, we're not chasing points. We're, we're actually just keeping the existing building and the embodied carbon all in it. Um, 
but yes, that mentality. Um, and I think Josh, it, to the point of, uh, you know, us gray haired folk versus the, the ideals and the approaches that, that your graduates are having towards looking at the job site, the sustainability, you know, um, are they come? Are, are they think is is this on their mind? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, one nice thing about being gray haired is you can see the next generation come up and and um, pros and cons. Sure, just like any other generation that are generalized, but um, you know, being sustainable, being green, being um, environmentally conscious is at the forefront of most of their minds. Like that usually they're directing how how can i do what you just said but more sustainable and, and so that's a that's a real promising push from that generation uh where to be very, very frank with you you know my the first half of my career that wasn't a consideration for us tradespeople. Sure. um and so the you know the the this up and coming generation should should take pride in that and, and they do actually from what i see I think you're doing a great job on the penance piece there, Josh. I think that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, with your clients and your, you know, jobs that you're working on, you know, are, is there a way we're failing? Is that, that we're not getting where we need to go? Like something we can do better? Um, Whether that be like education or conversations or, or just job site practices? Um, yeah, I think... I mean, I think we need lots more craftspeople from what I can see. I, like I've spent a bit of time in Ontario and I know there are far more out there. Um, but um, yeah, in terms of education, like I, I, I wasn't, uh, I was really confused to, to see the masonry, the heritage masonry program uh, close in at Algonquin. Yeah. Um, with the center block just starting up, it just built a brand new facility and then sometime, somehow mysteriously it closed down. I, I don't understand that. Yeah, that was um, crushing, for sure. Also, the, the quality of education as well. Um, you know, I was critical when I was at Algonquin of it being a, an Ontario college program. I don't think we need college programs for craftspeople. Um, you know, there's a craft college in Fredericton. Um, Actually, I, sh I shouldn't talk about that. I don't know enough about it, but um, like we don't need we don't need it to be influenced by um, by code, like learning how to build veneers. Uh, like I, I think there's far uh, there's more than enough need to uh, develop a program of and sorry in stone masonry in you know in heritage uh, carpentry. I can see as well also with metalwork. Um, lead work, all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's more than enough need to just develop like uh, heritage stonemasons, uh, heritage carpenters. Josh, you, you would know a lot more about this and I'm kind of talking over my butt here, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's so much more to learn than what Algonquin uh, provided, even though it was kind of the, the one of its one of a kind. Um, I think that there's a lot of room to develop uh, develop this field, and I think it would help um, engineers, architects, uh, designers, planners uh, immensely to have like a huge amount of people coming out of uh, craft colleges or craft programs. Yeah, yeah. Sam, I'm curious from the larger business, you know, of, of the people on here today, just, you know, where do you see, you know, the interest, where do you see the, uh, where could we be doing better, you know, at, at your scale, um, you know, where are we failing? Where, where do you see the young people, generational gaps, you, you know, the knowledge, you know, retiring craftspeople? Where yeah, we... I, I think Stephen, we saw this about 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, that the, the trades were not really getting Everybody wanted to be an architect, an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. Um, so, you know, some of these noble crafts were, were being cast aside. Um, and, the, you know, you, you go back 100, 200 years ago, I mean, being a mason or being a carpenter, there were those are the people that built these cathedrals. Yep. They were and they worked hand in hand together 
with the bishop or the cardinal or whomever. Um, so, and then not only did they build them, but they maintained them. Yep. And we've kind of lost that. And I think we, we've been fortunate ourselves. We've been fortunate that um, because of our size, and this is this is terrible to say because it is only because of our size that we're able to uh, get young people to uh, come into the trade. And we have an in-house conservator who's a CAP member, Donovan Pauly. Donovan does an extensive amount of training with our people. Uh, we outsource, so we'll bring people in, whether it's on the carpentry side, on the steel side, all of that. We, we bring people in to educate our people. This stuff at the standard masonry school, it's not being taught. I mean, at the Algonquin College and, and whatnot, yes, they're being taught at Willow Bank. And we're big supporters of the schools. But at the, the usual typical, you know, local 27 carpentry level, they're just learning this new style stick framing and the way they go. The, uh, the masonry school, and we've actually donated so much product to them. Terracotta, some of these kids didn't even know what terracotta was. You know, it, it, they wouldn't know if it bit them in the rear end. They That's had no friend. knowledge of it. But we're actually now seeing a resurfacing um, in the architectural world. Uh, one of the largest terracotta structures going up is here in Toronto. We have the, we're fortunate enough to be doing it, but it's, it's a $20 million, just the terracotta. Uh, and again, it's, it's, you know, it's a newer technology where it's a thin wall terracotta, but it's a fully ter and it integrates both a thin wall system and the traditional systems. Uh, but again, uh, I'm actually having to, and Donovan educate our workers on the terracotta because to them it's, it's quite foreign. The, our new construction side, our restoration guys have, have been dealing with the terracotta. The, the people on the restoration side have been dealing with it for years. But on our new side, they're just like, what is this? Yeah. Right? And we're, it's part of your trade. It's part of your craft to know this. How do you not know it? Yeah. But we are actually you know, actively trying to get uh, young people interested in it. We're spending the time. And then you know what? I'm actually quite happy if they're originally from New Brunswick and they want to go back to New Brunswick, that they're taking that knowledge with them. I don't begrudge them. It's great to see that we've been a part of it. That's why I push so hard for apprenticeship training. That's why we do, you know, again, because we're, we're the size we are, we have a, a full training facility that will fit 40 people here. So we're constantly bringing architects, engineers, building owners here for training sessions. So that they understand what they're getting to. One of one of the biggest things, Steve. One of the biggest uh, be in my bonnet, if we want to call it that, is the building code requirement. If you have an operable window in a new building, it can only open 100 millimeters, four inches. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, and it makes no sense to me. So now you're forced to accommodate people's comfort levels with acclimatized uh, area, whether it's air conditioning or heat, rather than them being able to open the window and enjoy a bit of fresh air is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And that one, that one to me, we every building that we do that we're, we're, we're actually asked to um, restrict the windows, the first thing that the end user asks is, how do I get this back out? Because I used to be able to open my window all the way. It's dumb. I, I, I that one to me, Someone's going to have to explain the theory. I know it's so that people don't jump out the window. Yeah. But yeah. That, that, that's a bigger problem we got if they're going to be jumping out windows. That's a bigger <laughs> problem we have. So. But, but to your point, Sam, it, it really is not understanding how that thermally massive building performs, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no thermal mass in, in conventional stick frame. And they don't understand that that building is not the same creature. It performs completely different. Different. Um, and uh, and I think certainly understanding that how the existing buildings work, higher ceilings, double double hung windows, all are purpose. They're not just you know for fun and giggles. Um, I do like the idea that uh, you know to your point that architects are masons who couldn't work a hammer and chisel. Um, I like that. Idea. <laughs> a fun little poke there um, when we go back historically for sure. 
Um, Even if I, if I could, sorry. Yeah, please, Josh. Um, you know, back to education. I, I think education is key. You know, whatever your passion is, uh, if you come to me, I'm going to say you need more education. I, I just think that's the yeah. most important thing you can do in your career. And so I, I tell my students, they come to me and they're going to be tradespeople, um, then craftspeople and then artisans. And the, and the only transformation between that, the only thing you can do to transform yourself is experience. Um, and luckily we're past where, when I was in high school, um, you're either gonna have a bright future and off you go to university, or you're not so bright, you better take a trade. And luckily we're past that. And also we're past gender inequality in, in we're getting there. I'm not saying we're past it. Um, I have 18 students and six of them are females. Uh, the last two years I've had 50% females. I'm quite proud of that. And it's more about what, what, where is your passion lie? Not how much you can lift, not, not how strong you are. It's about um, using your brain. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite proud of that. And I think we're, I, I definitely see over the past decade that we're getting over that hump of um, this is a trade. This is trades for people that aren't that smart. This is trades for men. Um, there, there's much more um, professionalism attached to it now. I think that's an excellent place to pause there, Josh. I can't agree with you. Uh, I, 100%. I totally agree with you. Um, and some of the best trades people I know are women. And uh, um, totally agree. Left brain, right brain. We need more of that. We need more of the education of us and the education of our clients as well. So lots of stuff. This has been awesome. We're going to do breakout rooms now. A few things you want to jump in and talk about too. <laughs> uh, yep. Cornelius, you've been on a few, a few of these work rooms. Uh, that's excellent. Grateful, grateful. To have yeah. You. My second one, like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a tradesman and well educated. So, um, from Germany. So, um, and I think one thing is like, I just was telling like that you can um, talk to an engineer on one side on the, and to um, like to work together in the process from the beginning to the end. And like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I also close the envelope when you make a wall or something like that's important. The quality yeah. is depending on the tradesman and not on the engineer, I yeah. think. But one that, thing and that but but that relationship in in europe and germany for sure you know of that trades and engineers and the respect and the guild like you know we lost that when we came over here and we never gained that back we never gained that respect that that uh yeah respect's a really good word you know um to yeah. the trades we never had it here we've never you know even you know the most magnificent churches in in north america you know a lot of them are just european trades people that came over and built them because we didn't have it and we certainly lacked it um and uh i think it's a huge i think it's a huge point for news really i'm just we were having a talk and i'm just gonna let josh finish we were i was we we're asking on in my on my breakout group the question whether there was opportunities for certain um, clients who like or government often programs that they would embed in the site a mandatory training program and Josh was starting to answer that question. Oh, wow. I, I would really like to hear that answer before we all got whisked back into the main room. I had a great answer and I'm pretty sure Stephen just hung up on me. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you can go ahead, Josh. I'm just kidding. Um, so, you know, Province House, I kind of alluded to that earlier, um, really, really significant building for the entire country. And um, we're very fortunate that one, one of my strong partners is Parks Canada. Of course, they, they are charged with looking after that. And they wrote right into the contract, um, locals will be hired. Uh, so that was one part. So they, they're going to leave the legacy of at least as much as the locals can absorb of, of the knowledge of how to um, keep those skills local. And they also wrote directly into the contract, the heritage carpentry students will be directly involved. Wow. Um, and I could have just reached out and hugged them because, <laughs> you know, we're gonna, I, I, I turn away 95% of the people that call and say, hey, I've got a great project for you to work on this year. Um, and I have that luxury because we have students that are going to be building 
some of the most important windows in the country. And I, I dare say that experience will be on their resume for the rest of their lives. So, so for me, I kind of say I'm teaching recess. Like my students <laughs> cannot wait to get there, cannot wait to work. Can we stay extra hours tonight or for lunch or something like that? And to work on a national historic site is pretty significant. And, and just like anybody, any human with anything is they tend to rise to the occasion. So we're doing something really important and, and they're absolutely there with bells on ready to do that. That is awesome, Josh. That is awesome and very inspiring for sure. So to sort of wrap up, we're just going to go around the horn here and uh, I'm going to start with Scott and just the idea of, you know, sustainability, the trades, the climate crisis, your kind of final thoughts on where we need to go or what we're doing. Yeah, just final thoughts. Scott? Um, I'm not, not sure what to add, just like the, just the general idea of if you have a pre-industrial build, building, take a pre-industrial approach. Um, and I think, you know, it might be hard with the way that we currently approach buildings, um, very challenging to the hierarchy, um, the, the, the way that we, we form a hierarchy around, uh, conservation. Um, but, um, yeah, that's that's all I have. That. Uh, it's that's not all. That's a pretty that's a pretty big important piece to really think about, and I think it's I think it's great. Um, really really appreciate your input, Scott. Sarah, Fox. Um. Yeah, I think maybe the key takeaway. I, well, there's a lot of takeaways, but just we need to fight to make sure we don't allow ourselves to get pigeonholed and, you know, cast it regarded as a. a kind of niche trade because the truth is there's so much overlap and um, in the bigger picture of what we do sure yeah like I could spend all day tinkering away a little piece of flaking paint on a wall but I mean the reality is we have a lot of potential um, to play a big role in it, sustainability approaches um, but I think we really need to advocate for ourselves and kind of force our way into those conversations and show people that we kind of belong in this Venn diagram of sustainability and heritage and craft because it's not I don't think it's obvious for people on the outside that we are inherently part of that. Um, yeah, for sure. Advocate for it. I agree a hundred percent, Sarah. I, um, I can't, uh, I, absolutely. Sam, your, uh, key takeaways. Uh, my key takeaways is that I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by today and I hope that we all remember as cap members. Yes, we are stewards for these heritage buildings. But I, I want everyone to understand that we are stewards of this, this land. We're stewards of the future of what happens with climate change. We can make, a, we can make a, an impact, albeit small. All of those small impacts together are going to, at some point, accumulate into a big impact. If we don't do that, now I have, I have a couple of interests. One is our business revolves around restoration. But I also have an 18 month old granddaughter that I'd love to actually enjoy the environment that I've enjoyed. Yep, for sure. For sure. Those are uh, profound words, Sam, and I really appreciate that. Gosh, the man who teaches the new generation coming up, what are your key takeaways? Um, I, I'm really um, pleased with being um, asked to partake in this. I, you know, everybody I met and all everything I've heard, including the breakout rooms are, we all have the same heart. We all have the same passion and we're kind of at in each corner of the country or perhaps the world. And if we just keep charging forward, knowing that we're all preaching the same thing, I think, I think there's a lot of power in that. Excellent. Well, thank you to our four panelists, to Sarah, to Scott, to Sam and Josh for their unique viewpoints and really important um, broad ranging viewpoints. This was super interesting conversation, super important, and um, we couldn't have done it without them. Grateful to everyone who has joined us and been listening. Um, the fifth and final will be next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is the National Trust Conference um, where uh, Dima, Chris, Tom, and myself will be collecting from the four workrooms, um, everyone's thoughts from the Miro board, putting them all together, and we are going to attempt a cohesive 
uh, um, functional conversation about some incredible input from everyone uh, in these workrooms. So again, thanks for participating. Thanks to our panelists and uh, 145 on the button. Thank you, everyone. Yes, sorry, just quickly, Steve, yeah, just as a reminder, you do not have to be um, registered to the national conference to participate in these discussions. The, the, it's a separate link and open to everyone. Excellent, excellent. So with that, thank you everybody and have a great day.